Good morning, my friends. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today, Pastor Ron Wirtz. He uh, has been a friend of Mark and Betty's for a few years. And uh, Mark highly recommends him, so we're so thankful, uh, Pastor Ron, that you're here with us today. Um, he has been in ministry for 25 years, um, mostly with the Alliance Church, and um, he's got 12 grandchildren that he's very involved with and enjoys very much. And, um, and so, Ron, we'd just like to invite you up here this morning. Thank you so much for filling in this week and next week. We get the privilege of having you twice, two days in a row, two Sundays in a row. And uh, I just want to pray for you before you get started. Thank you. Lord, we are just again so thankful to have Pastor Ron here with us this morning. And we just pray that your hand would be upon him, that you would open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive um, the words that you have for us this morning, Lord. And we just pray that you would speak um, through Ron as he speaks to us today. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. So if you're in Gibbons and you drive north of Gibbons on the highway, just a mile or two, you go under an underpass, right? You go down a little bit of a hill, and if you look off to the right, over on the hill, you'll see three big chicken barns, two double, or three double-deckers. They're 50 feet wide, 300 feet long. And I know that about that farm because I used to own that. Myself and another fellow were partners there. So at 46 years old, with four teenage kids at home, my kids were 18, 16, 14, and 12, I went on a mission trip. I went to the Philippines, and while I was in the Philippines, God said to me so clearly, I want you in ministry. Sell it all and go to Bible school. And I thought, that's ridiculous. I'm 46 years old. I got kids at home. They're all in high school. How can this ever happen? Well, over the next year, he did some amazing things in my life. And um, when I, by the time I was 49 now, three years later, I was ordained as a Christian Missionary Alliance pastor. I accepted my first call, which is at Fort Saskatchewan Alliance Church, is where I met Mark and Betty. They were much younger then. Their kids were little. <laughs> Um, and I've been in ministry ever since then, but it's only because of God's grace, because on my own, I could have never, ever imagined the journey that he would take me and my family on. So when Mark asked me to come out and fill in here, it kind of fit perfectly. The, uh, I spent eight years in Fort Saskatchewan, and then my wife and I took a calling to Lamont, Alberta, and we were there for almost 10 years to the day. And while we were there, my wife was diagnosed with cancer, and... Um, we had to leave ministry because she needed a lot of attention, and we moved back to Fort Saskatchewan where I had three adult kids living. I needed their help. We were going to the cross every week, sometimes twice a week, and well, some of you know exactly what all that's about. So she battled on for a couple of years, and now a couple of years ago she passed away. And um, since then, I've been working with the district in a transitional pastor role. My job has been to go and work with churches that are trying to find a pastor but struggling and just can't seem to find the person. So most of the time, you would go to a church on a Thursday and spend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday preaching and come back home. And then however long it takes, it takes to find a pastor. So that's what I've been doing the last three, four years. Um, that and filling in for pulpit supply. Um, I said to Mark earlier that I'm booked now till the end of February, but then uh, there's always churches looking for guys, old guys to come in and, just, and fill in for a little bit. So that's what I've been doing, and that's kind of fits into this plan um, as to where God is taking me. I said to Mark earlier, ideally, I would like to have a permanent part-time job, but that's my plan, not necessarily God's. So, um, Something that was unusual about coming here was that Mark and the church gave me the scriptures they wanted me to preach on. And normally churches wouldn't do that. They just tell you to come and bring a message. So this has been interesting to kind of look at where you have come from 
and where this uh, the book of John is going to take you. Now, I was here last week, actually. I showed up and I sat over here in this corner. Kind of wanted to get a feel for what was going on. It was chaos. <laughs> Those who were here last week knew exactly what I thought to myself. Holy smokes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was assured today would be much quiet. And it is. It's wonderful. So as I said, um, they gave me a text that I'm going to look at. And in a few minutes, we're going to look at John, the second chapter, and we're going to look at verses uh, 13 to 25. But before we go there, I want to back up to a text uh, that we'll find in Psalm 69, and I want to just read one little part of it because it fits for where we're going to go. And after hearing the prayer requests this morning, it fits with where you as a church are. So Psalm 69 starts out this way. Save me, O God, for the water have come up to my neck. I am sinking in a miry depth where there is no foothold. I am coming to the deep waters, the floods, they engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are failing, looking for you, God. Now it doesn't say in spite of all that. And I'm going to add that. But if we jump ahead to verse 9, it says, in spite of all that's going on, for zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for your house consumes me. So when I think of zeal, it's a great energy, a great enthusiasm takes over. So does zeal for God's house consume you? When you think about that, when you think of this great energy, a great enthusiasm for God's house, does that consume you? Are you taken over by that thought? You know, on um, February the 9th, 1964, 8 p.m. on a Sunday night, 73 million people turned their TVs on to watch a group of four young rock and rollers from England. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. We welcomed the Beatles to North America. The next few years, the world went crazy as the youth all over North America were consumed by these four young men. Everywhere you looked was young men dressing like them, talking like them. Uh, they let their hair grow, and at one point I had hair down to my shoulder. I was 13 years old. I remember it. It was unbelievable. Everybody wanted to be like the Beatles. We were consumed by them. A couple of weeks ago, I drove my 16-year-old granddaughter to Kelowna. From here to Lake Louise, I heard all about Taylor Swift. <laughs> I finally said, Sarah, please, let's not talk about her anymore. Four hours of listening to Taylor Swift, but young people today are consumed by her. They call themselves Swifties. They have a name that they call themselves because they follow Taylor Swift. People today generally are consumed by all kinds of things. Consumed by cell phones, social media, video games, TV programs. I live in a seniors complex and the other day I was talking to an older gentleman. He's on the board with me and he said, oh, Ron, I, I'll catch you later. I've got to get home. My show is on. Four o'clock in the afternoon. I don't even know what's on at four in the afternoon. But he's consumed by this show, and he cut our meeting off because he had to get home. He had to watch the show. A few months ago, I was in a doctor's office. There were 16 people in the waiting room. It's a, a bigger office. And I looked around at one point, and 12 of them were on their cell phones. You know exactly what I mean. They're all doing this. The four that weren't was me and three other people my age. <laughs> Everybody's consumed by things. This afternoon, I don't know if you're an NFL football fan, but there will be thousands and thousands of people pumped up and ready to go for two big football games. Last week, I watched some of the outcome of some of the football games, and it, at one point, the camera kind of panned over to this person who was crying, an adult crying because their team lost. We're consumed by all kinds of things in this world. But the question I have for us this morning is, are we consumed 
Does zeal for our house, our Lord's house, consume us? Do, do we have that same kind of drive and determination and feeling that all of these things, these examples that I've given you, does that describe us? So before we start into our text this morning, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, thank you for this morning, for each person who's here. And I too pray for all those people coming home from quizzing, bring them home safely, whether they won or lost or whatever, Father. We thank you that they could be a part of that, that they could go away for a break um, to focus on your word and, and to memorize uh, scripture, Father, that will stick with them the rest of their lives. Father, I pray that as we look at this text this morning, that you would speak to each one of us that's here, that you would give us a message, and that message may be different for each of us, but that there would be a message specifically from you to us. Father, I pray that you would fill this sanctuary with your spirit. Help us to sense your presence today as we look at your word. Uh, Father, and don't let me get in the way of what you want to do here today. Speak over me and through me and around me to your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our text that we're going to look at is John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. I want to look at three points or three ideas that come out of this text. Sorry. Saying to Mark that most churches today have lapel mics, and I like them because I'm kind of like to move around. The, uh, and he just smiled. He was going to attach this. He could take this right. Thanks, Mark. So the section we're going to look at, the subheading on that section is Jesus clears the temple. And if you've read your Bible at all, if you spent any time looking at Scripture, then you've read this story. You know a little bit about this. But I want to dig a little deeper into these verses and pull out some ideas that you might have read past because my experience with Scripture is that we read things all the time and then at some point we go back and we say, you know, I've read this a lot and i never seen this because we read past things. <coughs> the clearing of this temple, this is not the only time or the first time, or the, I should say the only time that this happened. It happened in Mark 11. It's mentioned along with the triumphal entry. Christ is coming in for his last week on this earth, and during that triumphal entry, there is a point there where he goes and clears the temple. So Mark mentions it later in Jesus' ministry. In Luke, we see it again mentioned, but it's later in Jesus' ministry. It's kind of three years into it. And then we find it here in John. And in John, this is actually the first time that it happens. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the fact Jesus is coming into ministry. He's only been in ministry a short while, and we'll read why that is. And the first thing he does is he blasts a bunch of people about what they're doing, and he turns over tables, and he gets angry, and he gets upset, and he yells at a bunch of people. And I thought, what a way to start a ministry. Jesus, you're missing something here. But I understand why he was like that. I understand what was going on. I was kind of thinking about this church, and I've imagined on a Sunday morning this summer, you come to church, and the whole parking lot is filled with a garage sale or a farmer's market. And there's cars all over the place, and people all over the place, and nobody gave them permission. And your plan was to come in here and have a service, yet all of this is going on, and I think we would be upset with that as well. So that's kind of what was going on. Jesus is coming to this temple. He's thinking about having a service there, do some teaching, meet some other people. And on the outside of the temple in the foyer, there's a farmer's market going on. So let me read the first three or four verses. Uh, John chapter 2, we'll start with 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple court, he found men selling cattle, sheep, doves, and other sitting at tables exchanging money. If, if you came and you wanted to make a donation or only had a $20 bill and you wanted to get some change, you'd go to that table. Or if you came there with one form of money and wanted to trade it to a different style, that's what these money changers are there for. So he made a whip out of cords and he drove all of them from the temple area. 
both the sheep and the cattle who scattered the coins and money changers and overturned their tables and to those who sold doves. See, doves were the cheapest animal to buy, so it's kind of targeted at poor people. But he says to those who sold doves, get out of this here, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples then remembered what Jesus had said. The zeal for your father's house will consume you. Zeal for your father's house will consume you. So we don't often see Jesus getting upset. We assume based on what happened here that he was upset. There's a, a few times that I could find where he was a, a little annoyed at things. Uh, some of you may remember the story. And he's in the temple on the Sabbath, and there's a man with a shriveled hand, and he's going to heal him. But the Pharisees are standing off watching this and waiting for him to do this, because then they're going to go after him about working on the Sabbath. So he gets upset when that happens. Uh, another story that we hear is when Jesus is teaching the, uh, the kids. Some of the families are bringing their kids to Jesus, and they're trying to move to the front. And the, the disciples actually say, no, 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 don't let the kids come up here. And then Jesus says, no, stop, wait. Let the kids come. Let the children come. He gets a little upset. And then we come to this verse. We kind of understand why he gets very upset. When you think about this temple, temples are made up of a bunch of different parts, a bunch of different rooms. Some of you would know, and I said, you're allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. Only the people closest to God, the most religious people, could go into the Holy of Holies. And outside of the Holy of Holies would be maybe a great room is what it would be called, a giant open space where most of the common followers would go. But all the way around the building outside would be almost like a deck, if you imagine a deck with a roof on it, and that's the foyer, or that's where all of the market is taking place. But you have to walk through that in order to get into the building. That's what really upset Jesus, the fact that they were not showing any kind of respect for this property. You know, when you look in the Old Testament, the term temple, it's used about 500 times. They're always talking about the temple this, the temple that. In the New Testament, it's mentioned 120 times, but they always refer back to the Old Testament temples. So as we look at this text, we see that he gets upset about the way people are treating his house. Then we'll move on and look at verses 18 through 22. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove you have authority to do this, to upset all these people and make these statements? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews replied, it took us 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But the temple he had spoke about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, in this text, what we often read past is that Jesus is making a statement here that's much bigger than what we realize. Some of you understand what he's talking about. Some of you know when he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. But the Pharisees didn't see it and neither did disciples. They didn't understand what he was talking about was himself. He is the temple of God, not the building. We're so used to thinking about this building as being the temple of God. But that's not what he's saying. Jesus is making a statement here that most people had just went right over their heads. This kind of thinking that this guy is the temple of God is unheard of. Nobody could imagine that. But if you think about the three years that Jesus walked on this earth, all of the people that walked with him, the conversations that they had, the people that prayed with him, sitting on hillsides on a sunny afternoon having a snack and just talking about things, all the while these people are meeting with God. All the while, this is Christ's Son, through the Trinity, this is God. And none of them figured it out. 
they're still kind of thinking about the temple as the holy place. If you want to meet God, that's where you go, is you go back to the temple, because there's something special about that building. God must hang out there, because that's where everybody goes. So this was a, a monumental change in the way that people connected with God and the way they worshipped with God, and it was far more personal than they had ever experienced before. They're just not used to thinking that this God could have a relationship with me at that level. You know, in my early days as a Christian, I didn't come to Christ till I was 24. I met my wife and Christ kind of within the same period of time. <laughs> she was a wonderful Christian woman, going to church all of her life, and I had never set foot in a church. Except on a Friday night, some friends who were Catholic went to their church, and I don't know what they were doing in there, but my friends and I were flicking our fingers through this water thing that we found in the front. We were flicking water at each other. That was the only church experience I had. <laughs> And my wife in those days worked at the Charles Campbell Hospital. And so she was often working afternoons, and often I wanted to go up and have lunch with her. She'd get a dinner break at 6. And on the way to the hospital on 111th Avenue and 128th Street, there was a church on the north side of 111th Avenue, and I would often go there. The door was always open, and I would go into this church, and I would sit in this quiet, old church with the creaky benches. You sit down on these hard wood benches and it would creak. And there's beautiful stained glass windows all over and carvings and pictures. And I loved going there because I always felt like God was there. I don't know why, but there was just this quiet peace about being there. And then a couple of years later, I kind of realized that I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to go there to meet with Christ. I didn't need to go there to have a conversation with God. But it was still hard for me to wrap my head around that because I had been programmed, much like the Pharisees, if you want to meet God, you come to the temple on this day, you bring a sacrifice, then we'll allow you into the great room where you would sit on the ground, and then you'll communicate with God. But we don't have to do that. God is wherever we are. I want to point out something here. When Jesus made this statement, the Pharisees responded this way. It took us 46 years to build this. You're going to restore it in three days? You're kidding. As I said, they missed the whole point. Where they are is show me, prove to me, then I'll believe you are who you said you were. That's kind of interesting because that's their philosophy, show me, prove to me. But they were not there in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. So they didn't see that happen and they assumed that it was right. But now somewhere along the lines they've got to this point where they are, show me, prove to me. Many people today are like that. God needs to prove himself to these people. There's still lots of people in our world that are like that. Show me, prove it to me. Biblical faith doesn't fit into their lives. It doesn't make sense to them. Yet they have faith in lots of other things that don't make sense to me. They have faith in world politics. They have faith in the almighty dollar. They have faith in the economy, local leaders. They have faith in their own ability. But people can't have faith in things often that they don't see. I struggle with that. I struggle with understanding why we live in such a show me, prove to me world. They missed Jesus' points right here in John 2. He was saying, I'm here. I'm the temple. I will always be here. But that thought went over their heads. Now, let's look at these last three verses. So now when he was at Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous sign he was doing and believed in him. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He knew what was in their minds and in their hearts. It doesn't say that in Scripture. He didn't need men's testimonies about man, for he knew what was in man. The first thing we see in this is that these people became believers because they saw. They saw what he did in this miraculous sign. And if you go back to chapter 2, verse 11, 
This is what Mrs. Domes talked about last week. That's the first miraculous sign that Jesus did, was turning the water into wine. And because they saw that, now they believed. 23 says he saw the miraculous sign. It was referred to these six jugs. This was the first miracle, and some of these Jewish people were convinced because of that. But as in the text that we just read now that we see, Jesus knew about their faith. He understood what was going on. He knew, he believed that these people had a very surface-like, shallow kind of faith. And the only reason they believed is because of this one thing that he did. See, God knows what's on our minds. He knows what's on our hearts. He knows whether we have a zeal for his house, a zeal for his son, a zeal for Christ, and that zeal consumes us. He knows all of that. So when I ask that question of you, I know that God knows the answer. So does our, our zeal for Christ, is it obvious to other people? When people meet you, do they think there's something about them and I can't quite put my finger on it. There's some, something that's they're very enthusiastic and excited about something, but I'm not sure what it is. Do people see that in you? Or is it kind of hidden? You have a strong faith, a belief, but it's hidden and nobody sees it. Are you consumed with your walk with the Lord, I guess, basically, is what I want to ask you. Or is it just part of your everyday life? You just come here every Sunday, go through whatever you do on Sunday, and then that's it, and Monday through Saturday night, you're back to your old world. Do we live a life that's based on faith and what we believe? Do we believe everything that's in this book? <laughs> Have we read what's in this book? Do we understand what Jesus is telling us? You know, this building serves a purpose, it does. But Jesus, folks, is the real temple. And he will serve you wherever you are, whenever you need him, he will be there. When I was in the Philippines, I was standing on a balcony. I had gone to a youth council, a youth conference in um, Cebu City. And there was hundreds of youths from all over the place. It was like a horseshoe-shaped motel. And we were on the second floor, and I was standing, or I was actually laying in bed, and I could hear all these kids making noise. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I got angry. And I thought, you kids are supposed to be in bed. What are you doing out here? This is a youth conference. I came out on the deck, and I looked out over all these kids. And there was anger in me because I thought they were partying and carrying on. They were actually having a prayer meeting. And I almost started to cry. They were having a prayer meeting at 3 o'clock in the morning because it's the only time the temperature allows you to. Because by 10, it's 120. So as I was standing there, almost crying, God said to me, Ron, I want you to serve my people. I want you to go back to Fort Saskatchewan or back to Gibbons, sell everything you have and go to Bible school. And as I said, in the beginning, I thought, this is ridiculous. How is this ever going to happen? I talked to my partner, we made an arrangement, he said, I can't pay you out all the money I owe you, but I will pay you out over three years. I'll give you X number of dollars every quarter for three years. And I didn't like that idea. But later I realized that gave me a fixed income for three years. And it was enough of an income that I could raise my 14 age kids and not have to worry about it, and I could go back to Bible school. But it all began back in the Philippines when God was very personal with me, and he spoke to me directly, and I spoke to him. And I said, God, I don't know how this is going to work. You must have a plan. I'll follow you. And I did, and I'm here today because of that. I want to encourage you to serve Christ with a zeal. Let his word, let him consume you. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Help us to draw and to make some sense of this and how you want to speak to each one of us. Father, we want to have faith in you and all that you say. Bless us in this coming week. We pray this all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen.